So I have one slide only, and uh, it's going to be a very, very unstructured uh, turbo tour through the last 20 plus years of my life. Um, I think the slide will probably frighten the shite out of most of you budding entrepreneurs. And you'll see why uh, through the three uh, busts that I've gone through, or the two, two and a half. Um, but I wanted to just talk a little bit about you know, the nature of the projects that I've been involved in and, and what things worked about them and what things didn't work and, and maybe the, the rationale or, or the decision criteria that I had when I was you know, getting involved in, in the various different ventures I got involved in. So what type of animal I am, first of all, obviously a risk taker, uh, willing to lose everything you know, consistently. Uh, and I'm a computer programmer. I, I always have been. I actually started when I was 14, and I still write code now. So that gives me a, an advantage over most people that start businesses in that I can actually build the product that I'm going to sell. And that allows me to take the path of least resistance in terms of the direction I take with the businesses that I start up. So in other words, I can see, look, you know, here's where I want to be. Here's what I think is a good business idea, but that's really hard to build or... I don't have a particular advantage over anybody else in this niche, so I'm going to take it over this direction. And not only is, that, is it that advantage, but also when I hire people, technology people, uh, I know how to measure them, I know how to figure them out, and I know when you know, they're, they're, they're talking through their arses or whether they're the real deal. And that's a really difficult problem that, uh, that everybody will face that's starting a business today. Most of you, I would imagine nine out of 10 will require the technology guy if you're, if you're not that person yourself. And I always say, the biggest piece of advice I always end up giving people is, if you don't have the technology guy in bed with you, not literally, uh, you don't have the foundations required to start the business. The technology guy needs to be invested in some way, either time, blood, sweat, and tears, but also they need to be a stakeholder in the business. And I'm not saying that because I'm a technology guy, but technology will drive the differentiators and the, the flash that your business has. Most businesses, most technology businesses, and most online businesses. Um, you know, just, just to, to get the history out of the way, I didn't go to college. Um, I went straight into writing video games. Uh, again, as I said, when I was 16, writing all these nerd letters to magazines, making 50 quid here and there. That's before most of you were born, I think. Um, and then I went to Waterford. I started to write video games. I wrote a few really good games uh, for Nintendo. They did really, really well. You know, top, top one, two, and three in, in the Billboard, you know, top 100. Very, very exciting. Made in newspapers in Dublin. Annual salary of 14,000 pounds. And I was never going to get any higher than that. Because as it turns out, you have to own the business to make any money out of it. And I didn't at the time. So the, se the first lesson, you know, I learned was that and I always wanted to measure my own success through financial gain rather than necessarily the beauty of the masterpiece that I was building. Um, subsequent to that, uh, that, that two or three years of my time in, in war for building games, I created my own video games company. I had a contract uh, to build a couple of games for a, for a company in California called Broderbund, a really successful company, great reach. So I had the makings of a really strong business. I had a team, six of us, uh, we were great at building video games. We had two contracts with a really big blue chip Californian video game distributor. On paper, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, let's figure out this clicker now. Oh, that's not it. Anyway, if someone could help me with the, if you go back to the slide. Um, in summary, we ran out of cash in six months. That's the first bus and that's the second bus. We ran out of cash six months into it. We had a great business, we had a great team, and we didn't understand basic accounting. And that's probably because we didn't go to entrepreneur school. Um, nevertheless, it was, a, it was a really great education for us. Uh, and it was my first crash um, in setting up my own business. The second one was when I set up a business called Voyager Technologies. Um, and that was really interesting because there I had spent three years in the south of France working for a travel technology company called Amadeus. Amadeus were a giant company. Uh, there were $2 billion in revenue distributed all over the world, and they were in pretty much every travel agency in the world. 
at the time when I was working there, building the software for them, there was a change in the laws in the United States in, in deregulation of the technology of the desktops in travel agencies. So companies, they're called GDSs, like Amadeus, Sabre, uh, and Worldspan, they were the, the triopoly in, in the world. There was a, a, basically deregulation came in and forbid them from controlling what software travel agencies were allowed to use in the travel agency. So in other words, another, instead of Amadeus owning the desktop and forcing that travel agency to use their software, the travel agency could, could buy their own software. So that was a trigger for me leaving Amadeus and saying, look, you know, I could actually build a much better version of this. Again, I'm the technology guy, that's easy for me to do. And I, I partnered up with a 65-year-old Colombian guy that I had met in the south of France over dinner at a really good party. He was a great guy. Uh, and he happened to have a business brain that I don't have. Just so you're clear, I don't have a business brain. Um, we teamed up together. We didn't have any money, but uh, we, had, we had savings. You know, I had probably 100,000 you know, quid at the time that I'd saved up. And we got a contract with Aeromexico in Mexico City, and it was a joint venture between Aeromexico and a company called Certel. Uh, a joint venture with American Airlines as well. So two companies created this venture and we got a contract for $300,000 to build their desktop for Mexico, Brazil and Argentina. Over the course of 10 years, that contract would have been worth about four or five million dollars. So it was a really exciting prospect. So I went from south of France to Mexico City, uh, booked into a hotel, spent nine months in the hotel building the software. Uh, that we told them that we already had, I should, I should mention. Um, software was built, software went in, it was really, really great. It was by far the best of its kind at the time uh, in that market, and they didn't pay the bills. So this, American Airlines pulled out of the joint venture, uh, Aeromexico and Mexicana were fighting with each other, didn't want to pay any bills, and the, the joint venture company went effectively bankrupt um, it wasn't bankrupt on paper, but they just weren't paying any bills. So I got stuck in Mexico after actually close to a year and a half, absolutely bust. I didn't even have the money to pay for that hotel bill at the time, and we had to negotiate with the hotel company a knockdown price for uh, the time I'd spent in the hotel. So it was really a shitty uh, time, but we had a great piece of software. And if you look at the strap line down the bottom, Luck, timing, more luck, sacrifice, trust, a good idea, great execution, cajones. Cajones is a Mexican word which you can Google, a Spanish word, should I say, but luck, luck was it. You know, I mean, I've gotten lucky several times, big, big style lucky, and this was one of them. Uh, I had met some senior executives in American Express, Mexico, big blue chip company, lots of money, and gave them a quick you know, look at the software. American Express also have a travel agency, uh, and it was pretty obvious that this software would have worked for them. Um, immediately started to work with Amex and they provided a little bit of oil to pay my wages while I was in Mexico to, to basically feed me while I was there. And six months later, we had a contract with American Express for three and a half million dollars to provide a worldwide solution for American Express with that software. So, I mean, the look is incredible. I only happened to meet the senior vice president of travel for American Express in Mexico City again over dinner. Luck is definitely there. Nevertheless, we did execute on it very well. We built the team up to 15 in Mexico, and then subsequently we moved to, actually I moved to Boca Raton in Florida because we had licensed that code to IBM uh, for a worldwide license. So between those two clients, we had signed up $25 million of a 10-year commitment. So we had the makings of a business. We had effectively our investor. We never took any, any investment money. We, we wouldn't have known how to do that. And even if we did know how to do it, we probably wouldn't have liked to do that. Um, so we built a business all the way to 96. I moved back to Ireland. We had 35 people there. Um, then we built it up to about 150 people in Dublin. We had an office in Brighton as well. Business was going really well. We were making a, about 15 million euros uh, a year in revenue, of which about 8 million was, was, was EBITDA. So it was a really healthy business. It was growing by 20 or 30%. And you know, at the time, it was a great lifestyle business. We were throwing off money and we were increasing our scale, but we had run out of you know, ideas. 
uh, in terms of how are we going to are we going to exit this business now? Are we going to sell it, or should we do something else? So uh, we came up with a new product, and we totally reinvented the company. We we even changed the name of the company from VTI to Eland to to dispense of our skin, really. So so in other words, we. People didn't even know who the hell we were after we changed our company and our branding because we invented a new product. But that product was invented as a leapfrog from where we were with our technology at the time. And that allowed us to basically sign up the same customers we already had, but with the next generation of product. Uh, the reason we did that is because we were a tiny Irish company. Nobody takes you seriously, and certainly no senior executive is going to write a big check for a 30, 40 man company. So we acted with guerrilla kind of tactics. We, I won't say that we lied, but we were very, very good with how we used the truth. Um, and that is actually a key part of, it's an Irish thing, actually I think it's a, it's, it's a very Irish thing. It's not dishonest, but sometimes you have to use certain tactics to punch above your weight, and we were really good at it. Fort Wayne to, to uh, 9-11, we had at that stage Probably 80% of our business was selling to the, the world's airlines, United Airlines. Uh, pretty much both airlines that went into the Twin Towers on 9-11 were our customers. Uh, and all our other airlines were very big airline customers that all immediately suffered cash flow issues when 9-11 happened. We almost went out of business. We had 150 people that went to 90 in the course of three months. We immediately saw that there was going to be a complete crunch on the cash. We had about 18 months of cash to burn through, and we would have burned through it all if we didn't act. So we went back to 90 people, and in 2003, uh, I sold the business to a company called CETA, a big airline giant. But we had declined over uh, during that time, um, so much so that we had almost run out of cash. So lesson number two, and third bust almost, as I say there, is Pick your eggs timing well. You know, we actually hadn't even thought about it. When would be a good time to exit? We were doing really well, but we were we were arsing around in terms of our the corporate approach or the structured approach to it. We should have made a plan for an exit. It should have been right. This is our target. This is where our product line is going to be. This is where our revenue needs to be. This is how the company needs to be, and this is the shape that we need to be. And this is when we're going to exit. But we actually just meandered along, everything is good, everything is happy. Something always goes wrong. And I would have made four or five times the amount I made if I had exited that business two years earlier. So that was another lesson, and quite an expensive one. Um, next piece of luck in 2005, I spent a couple of years uh, working for the business that bought my business. Um, and I bumped into, actually I got introduced to the founders of a business called Car Trawler. Uh, car trawler was about six, six, nine months old at the time, and it had a, you know, a little website doing car rental, online car rental. Um, the two guys running it weren't technology guys, nor did they know anything about the airline industry. They actually had cars that they actually rented, which is a really shitty business. Other lesson in life: don't own anything. Sell something on behalf of others online. Um, so Car Trawler was, if you think about it, they had access to car rental. They had access to the product at zero cost all over the world. I had the technology and the contacts around the airline industry all over the world. So I bought into Car Trawler. I bought a chunk of it in 2005 and started to build a technology platform that became, in essence, a B2B platform that anybody in the world, any online business in the world could use to sell car hire. Uh, we have been almost uncontended in that space since I joined in 2005, the end of 2005. Uh, a few have started up and gone away, and we acquired one of our competitors uh, last year, uh, Holiday Autos. Um, now we book about, uh, we'll book this year about three million car rentals uh, to consumers, probably north of 10,000, 10 to 12,000 people a day will book a car through a system we run. Uh, we, we do exclusive car hire for just short of 60 airlines, including recently Aer Lingus, and that allows us to see airline traffic of, of close to 700 million airline passengers a year. So for that traffic, we get all of their itinerary details. We know who they are, we know where they're flying and how long they're flying for, and we push out car rental product to those customers uh, in a, on a dynamic basis. 
So if you're flying with any of our airline customers, for example, we'll have about 14 opportunities to push car rental to you. And we do that pretty much uh, better than anybody else could do it in the world. We have seven years of historic car rental pricing that allows us to make sure that we get more money than anyone else out of you, the consumer, for every possible chance to sell. So it's taken this time, what are we, 2003 and what are we now, uh, 2014, a long time. I mean, when I got into Car Trawler, I had a two to three year plan. Uh, I was going to get in, build some value, sell my shares and, and get out. Here I am, uh, eight or nine years later, still in. Uh, you may have seen that we did a, a first round uh, financing about three years ago to a private equity company, ECI, uh, in London that valued the company according to the newspapers at 100 million euro. Um, this time we've, since ECI have invested, we've uh, just, over, just over three times the uh, profit in that three years and we continue to grow at about 60 or 70 percent a year and that's on a very, very big base. We have 200 people uh, in Dublin and 100 people in the call center in, uh, in Poland. So we're a small company in terms of human uh, capital, uh, but it is our biggest cost. It is about 80, 90% of our cost. We're a very virtual business. It's all one piece of software running on a website. And I would say the thing that uh, the thing that makes it attractive from an investment point of view is that it's a very defensible business model. So the next thing, uh, when you have an idea in your head, if you come to me, and I think my details are there, they are, and you're all more than free to, to send me an email from we'll have a coffee, um, eight or 900 coffees, I can squeeze that in pretty quickly. Uh, but the one thing that I would challenge anybody with a business is, uh, how defensible is it? You know, how quickly and how cheaply can you erect a barrier to entry? From an investment point of view, uh, I invest in small businesses, uh, not very frequently, but frequently. And the two things I would look for is, first of all, who's the guy? Who's going to run the business? Do I trust that guy? Can he, she build up a strong business and very, very quickly and very, very pragmatically? But secondly, unless the business has a solid defensible position that it can get in place quickly, I wouldn't invest in the business. It's a lifestyle business. And there's nothing wrong with a lifestyle business, but if you want to really hit it big, look for ideas that before you even hit the radar of the big guys, you've already got it to where it needs to be. So that when someone comes to look at you, rather than copying you, they'll just try to buy you. Or they'll threaten to, to kill you, and then you'll sell to them. Uh, and we still have that. Even now, we have huge competitors, not direct competitors, threatening that if we don't sell out to them, that they'll, you know, they'll use their checkbooks and they'll destroy us. So, uh, lesson in life, get your technology guy, sell at the right time, and only bet someone else's money on your business. Thank you very much.